my partner Iran is on the other side. It's a really long, narrow uh, living room, and we both work in uh. the same room. And we started a micro press together, so he's in charge of poetry, and I do the comics. What is the micro? Um, press my, it's called Nat with a G. Hmm. Because uh, they're so um, um, uh, uh, present in the Israeli summer, um, and the point is to publish books that wouldn't get published anywhere else, and it's kind of like the annoying presence of nuts. <laughs> yeah, cool. but um, I I wanted to show you because um, look what. Look what you've created. <laughs> oh my god, Karen. Oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, so I have a, a direct um uh for instance, um uh the book about the pig captain, um the Australian oh what's his name? Captain Captain Good Vibes. Oh for yeah, instance. I remember that. Yeah, all these things that I would never have known about and that kind of blew my mind. I've been slowly gathering. Um, so although I'm very distant from comics, I'm, I'm very, very close. And this is this is like our micro press uh, studio. So it has all the boxes and Christmas tree, right? Is that a Christmas tree? Yeah. <laughs> I have a Christmas tree because <laughs> I really like them. <laughs> well, I'm Jewish. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Uh, yeah, I want, I want to. I mean, um, I grew up in in the Netherlands when I was a kid, and I was always really jealous of. Um, I went to a British school, and I was always really jealous of my friends' Christmases. I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world, and I've my fantasy has always been a Christmas tree. It's a, it's a fake plastic one. Well, that what I showed you was supposed to be my studio, but um, I, uh, I I I much prefer um, sitting where I'm not wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, you use that room for an office for Nat, right? Well, yeah, but, but not. It's it's um it's just because I can't be bothered to um uh I tidy it up or build proper shelves, but um it's okay. I yeah. yeah. Well, I'm jealous <laughs> of the books you have. I'm, I mean, well, the, the the thing is, it's because it, it's a, it's I owe you a deep gratitude, and I I think um I think that sharing even this YouTube channel or just sharing knowledge about other artists or books um is the best way, and I think especially in comics, you want that personal in because a lot of time this is a language that's so idiosyncratic, especially if you didn't grow up with it. Yeah. Um, that you need someone else's passion to get you into it. Yeah, absolutely. That's I think that's really true. I get really I get really excited by um, hearing other people talk about things that they're excited about. Yeah. Know? Like yeah. like it'll be an artist that like personally didn't really mean anything to me, didn't do anything for me. But then like if you hear somebody explain something about this artist and like what they mean to them, then then it gets you like amped on them as well. So exactly. interesting, interesting yeah. thing that happens, you know. It's, um, it's the, yeah, it's the only way I learned how to read comics in the first place. Um, I think I only started reading when I was 23 or... Yeah. I, uh, I love, I really, there's a there's a really tiny comics festival in Tel Aviv, which is about to happen. It happens in August and it's basically all we have. Um, and it's just, a, it's just no more than 15 tables <laughs> with some zines. Yeah. Um, and I really want, I knew that the people making the zines were cool and I wanted to be part of them, but I, I had no no understanding of what the medium was. Um, so it started with with just wanting to be the, the, the friend, a part of the community or friends with people because clearly everyone that was in it was really passionate about it and that what stuck with me. And I, I would walk into like the one comic store in Tel Aviv um, which had Chris Ware books and yeah. look at them and not be able to decipher anything. And oh. I, <laughs> so, 
it took yeah. such a long while to understand yeah like it's advanced reading for comics or something you know because even the panel structure and stuff like you don't necessarily read the page the way you would if you like read like another comic you know where it's just like over this way and then down and then over or whatever like sometimes it like kind of loops around snakes around and stuff and um you have to kind of like you have to figure that out yourself though you know yeah and and i think that once you do um it has kind of like um it's it it in retroactively enriches every single comic you ever read and a lot of times i read books like that where the book itself i just sit around and stare in the ceiling um thinking about other books that I've read, even if they weren't comics, even if they were prose or poetry, because it has such a way of presenting language or just expanding the world and, and your own memories even, or, or the, your way of perceiving um, your world and the things that you like and your friends and people who, and even things, uh, what I especially like is you notice things that you never would have noticed in real life. It en enriches everything. So so much experiment, uh, experimentation is allowed in it. There's no barrier to what you can do in, when someone is on their own device. I think that's why I love these books so much, because they make everything visible. I, I'm talking about comics now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so when did you go back to Israel? When, when did you leave? Well, I uh, um, I had just gotten a, a day job at a bookstore, which I was really looking forward to, and then the epidemic um, happened, and and um, we were quarantined. So I was listening to your YouTube channel, and um, uh, around uh, my partner suddenly bursts out laughing because you said, um, I think it was on the episode with Leslie Stein. <laughs> he says, "Oh, you know what would have been the worst." <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Whoever the fellow is, <laughs> and Iran, Iran burst out laughing because it, it was me. <laughs> Wait, um, so but I, no, I understand that because how long were you at CCS? Because I feel like when we saw each other in France, you were already the fellow there. Oh yeah. Well, I kind of uh, worked the. Uh, I kind of worked it because I I um. Well, I was the fellow at 2018. When, when I met you, and then I, I came back for another um, semester, because um, oh. I I just couldn't get enough. <laughs> so you were I, the fellow for two years in a row? Well, it's one and a half, yeah. Um, well, oh. it, it's more complicated, because um, my fellowship was, was a little bizarre, because I was a fellow, but also I was a first year, because I never went to comic school, so I I took all of the classes and I was um, doing all the assignments with the first years. So we tried to find a way, figure a way to make it work so I can stay, but also so they could have other fellows. <laughs> um, oh. So we had an applied cartooning fellow, which was um, MK Survey for um, uh, graphic medicine. And then uh, Tommy Parrish came as um, Cornish fellow. For a month, oh. um, and, and so we had uh, two month-long fellows, and then I was there for a semester, an, an extra semester, and then I left on the last day of 2019. Um, I would have stayed for a year, but um, but my partner stayed in Israel, and we were away for a year and a half, so it was. I really had to come back, and um, and then. And I was heartbroken, but then um, everyone was quarantined anyway. <laughs> I see. Yeah, because I feel like that would have been terrible because, I mean, you're already I, mean, I lived in the hotel in the Coolidge right. and yeah. I can't imagine being quarantined in that hotel. Yeah, I mean, the entire idea of the school is that we're quarantined, but the thing together. and I was especially heartbroken for this class because um, um, the 2020 and the 2021 class, uh, I don't know from other years, but such a tightly knit family group that was always together, giving each other energy, feeding each other. Everyone was such a unique artist, but also really, you, you could tell that the way that they treated comics so seriously was really pushing everyone along. And um, there were talent shows and museums and, and theatrical shows. And we, 
did much more than the school, uh, the actual cartooning. It was so alive <laughs> um, because I, I lived in cities my whole life and I found it really difficult to understand uh, before I came to the town um, how how life looks like when when all this kind of stimulation is gone. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, I'm not a, a nature person. <laughs> Oh, and really? um, yeah. <laughs> I think with my whole artistic education, everything that everyone tells you is you have to be where things happen. You have to be in the, in the center of things in order for you not to be forgotten. And hmm. um, you have to constantly um, merge with the artistic world. And it's isolation is always considered like the outliers. With people that you know intimately and that you see every day, you're able to take to have the greatest adventures because people will do things so much weirder <laughs> because you there's trust. So mm. we had best parties amongst ourselves and and these made crazy films and 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 really you could see the layers. I don't know the things that you could you you never thought you could do. Like by the end of the the those two years, we formed. A semi-professional Rocky Horror Picture Show shadow casters um, amongst them because because it takes like these adventures take trust and I don't know and and they're so fun. Well, that's the energy that you brought to the school, I'm sure, because when I was there for that year, it wasn't like that at all. Like, a, um, I don't, I mean, there, I still am friends with some of the students there and stuff, but it wasn't the kind of crazy party adventure that I thought it was going to be when I went in. And that's probably me too, because I'm also like um, kind of introverted. And I, my thing is like, I push people away. And I, I know that I did that with the students there. Like, I know I did. So oh, no. that's the energy that you brought there and you made it something really exciting and fun. And, and uh, I feel bad for the students that were there when I was there because I didn't do that at all. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I would like, I, I want to correct you on this because A, I think um, I was really lucky to be with people. I mean, I would never, I'm, I'm introverted. I'm an, I'm an, I think I'm a natural introvert and everything that appears outside of that is my own, is trying to fight it really hard um, because I've been hurt by my, um, I was really secluded a long time. And then when I saw the other side, it, it takes a lot of, like, I, I'm, I live between two extremes. I mean, we shared that thing at, at, in France, mm -hmm. and I think I had the most fun with you and Yvonne at like 4 p.m. Yeah. singing songs, and it's like not at all. I mean, you're you have like a lot more fun in life than I do. I really think that because <laughs> I remember the 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 residency in France, like you're saying, like you were playing ping pong and stuff with them, and there was like a wasn't there like a dance party or something happening there. Oh like, yeah, but I mean, what it was, I mean, we had, uh, there's a lot of people involved in that. Yeah. Um, it was hard for me to understand why I'm so um, drawn to the American comic scene. Um, and what, what, because there is so many, there are so many talented cartoonists here in Israel and we do have a group, but, but the, the fact that everyone shows up to the festival and they, everyone has new minis and everyone is really excited and it's a whole thing um that energy of doing things and all you want is for more comics to exist you just want more <laughs> books to be out yeah, you don't yeah. want to steal anything. i think in the art world where you're fighting over museum territory or something it can get a little but we just benefit from having more um yeah. And I started my career as an illustrator. I, I mean, I started from illustration. Yeah. So, and then, um, so I, I think I, I see it in a different light. Yeah. So how did that happen? How did you start doing that stuff? Were you just like sending out illustration work like blindly to different publications? Um, well, I, I should say I, I was a dancer for the bigger part of my life. And then when I, when that stopped, I thought, I thought I was gonna go to medical school. And then my dad said, um, he knew like I was giving up an expressive part, an artistic part of my identity and that I would probably fall into a deep depression if I completely took a left turn from the arts. And he, yeah, advocated for art. So, but in Israel, the um, there's no 
undergrad degree for cartooning. Well, cartooning was out of the question because I didn't know what that was, but <laughs> but there's no under degree just dedicated to illustration. And and art I didn't want because that world seemed very cruel. And I definitely didn't want to be um, personally attached to something um, that will leave me really exposed. And I think also um, in comparison, Israel is such a non-politically correct, ruthless. I mean, the critiques that you get in art school, it, it, people are crying right to left. They they're wow. really extreme, um, and there's, I, and I think it's like a direct. There's a direct link to like us being a militaristic society. There's kind of like, and and also being so peripheral and that we have to. We always feel like claustrophobic or have to prove more, so we put a, allow things to get really extreme. Like you're either rise to the top. There's no, you you either make it or you don't, <laughs> kind of attitude. Yeah. And then, um, so it, but I was I was really young and and I also a late bloomer, so I hadn't experienced love. <laughs> so I spent all of my college life just living life for the first time yeah. and so I, I felt like by the end of it I hadn't learned anything so I enrolled immediately although I had amazing teachers and I only remember what they told me retroactively but uh, I enrolled immediately to an MFA uh, in New York for illustration and in, in there the, the emphasis is on career development a lot there's a course dedicated to professional practices to send your stuff send mailers out um, and they invite art directors each week to see your progress um, and to studio visits mm -hmm. and um, because it's in New York you, um, it was the first time I got the I think the crucial part was seeing how these institutions work so we visited the New York Times um, building and you see that all the art directors are are share a space and they have a giant wall full of postcards that the mailers that they get sent and the same in Penguin or all these publishing houses and when and it's right there and it's physical it's not just a tab on the computer and when they get um, a story they swivel the chair around and they see what so there's kind and then uh, over the years I saw my own postcards whenever I went to a show there they kind of pop up so you when you see and the Society of Illustrators also I got to see how um, um, the judging of these illustration shows uh, work and how how random everything is and also that the things that don't get selected they're not necessarily lost because someone will see them and then approach you five years later and all these things kind of um, shifted the way I approach because until then I was terrified of 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 what you said of of not getting not getting in or kind of measuring myself according I think I think with anything when you learn how how things work um, you become fearless and mm -hmm. then the more fearless you become or the more outgoing and send your stuff the more just opportunities you create that has nothing to do with the work itself it's more just about um, placing yourself in where opportunities can happen i think that's regarding illustration and and yeah. comics as well it's funny looking through it because like like that's the cat right there oh like I, I just got like obsessed with this cat <laughs> and uh like i drew like little diary comics about that being there like this was something just like some french guy writing or drawing in a cafe in in toulouse okay. and uh i have like a list of like things that oh yeah like, so Anna drew that. Oh, wow. <laughs> God. <laughs> a beer label from like a beer that I had with a cat underneath it. Wow. And then um, let me show you, like this was me walking back to my cabin in, in Dignac in France at oh, night. Wow. Just like listening to like the owls, like hooting and stuff. Yeah, that was incredible. And I just wrote down like a list of like things that happened every day when I was yeah. there. I, I have um, my, I, 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 the only thing that I collect is um, packages of, 
uh, like food and books. I have one from France, so I was collecting everything that came in the form of a sticker, and that's my diary. Oh, really? Like, every single fruit or package that I... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Good. Yeah, because uh, uh, I, I don't have a sketchbook, so... Um, this is yeah, because... Good. Yeah, that's... Wait, wait, what are that? Is it little presents, the stickers? And presents? Uh, it's uh, from book... I work in a bookstore now, so I peel all the stickers off of the books, like fifty oh. percent. Yeah, you draw really giant. Like I, that was one thing I learned about you in France is like for like one panel from your comic, it'd be like some giant sheet of paper. Oh uh, my god! <laughs> so that is that one page. What was yeah. that? It can even be half a page. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have to scan it in in pieces and, and put it together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was living in, in New York, um, because I couldn't take my scanner with me, I bought a refurbished one, because they're usually $4,000, but I bought a refurbished one for $1,000. And mm -hmm. then when I finished the two years, or th my three years, I sold it. I sold it to Richard McGuire. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bunch of his books, by the way. I go to when I went to Desert Island. They had like a box of his the books that he had sold to Desert Island for them to sell. And I was really? just like, yeah, like that, like came from his shelves. That he was just like, you know, he was cleaning out some of his stuff. So like, I got all these what books. Collect. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that yeah. was that was that was my real comic school. Is is um. I think, I mean, when people talk about comics or when talk about art, I usually have been in that field for a long time. You can see kind of like everyone, I mean, everyone has their own very unique opinion, but it, but we always talk about, oh, storytelling, pacing, uh, uh, the, the, the architecture of the page. Um, it's, it's these things that we are used to see. And every time I saw him pick up a book and talk about it, or suddenly hear him like go into a bookstore, pick up a book, and suddenly laugh really loudly, it's the most unexpected observations that come from absolutely nowhere. Like he can walk on the sidewalk and see a, a wrapped up elastic band and it just his laugh hysterically or or immediately take the there's and and on his Instagram, the things that he curates, it's from art and comics and music. And it's always so, it's just so, it, it's it's like we we said earlier, is you need to hear someone to see the beauty in a block of wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm really jealous about the books that he has, because I think they all contribute to the puzzle that is his. Well... When you were working, when you were working with him on that book here, were you at his house or at his apartment working? Uh, no. Um, uh, um, I he had a studio. He's not there now, but he has a, he had a studio, and I was there with um, um, my classmate from SBA, Mayel Dolly Dolly, well Dolliva or Dollyvu in 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 English, um, who is now. Um, with uh, Josh O'Neill, they she has a uh, Beehive books. So what happened was I I met Richard at Bill Bill Cardellopoulos and Austin English and David Ness's house at a party, just randomly, and he talked about it. The uh, sorry, he had he had just talked about it at the Brooklyn Comics Fest um, about a uh, graphic novelizing here, yeah. and it blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and then I knew that. I would regret it for the rest of my life if I, I didn't see how this was going to be made. And so I I basically said, um, um, offered myself as assistant. I said, I know nothing, but I have time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he said, sure, I really need an assistant. Um, I need someone to, to scan and to flatten. And I knew nothing about comics or Photoshop, even though I went to art school, but I wasn't paying attention. And and the first few weeks, I was flatting stuff on a light box with ink. <laughs> oh. 
Wait, and so then, what was it? Was he just hand you layers uh, for each page? Like these are the layers for this illustration on this page or something? Well, it, it was um, a bunch of stuff because he'd been working on it for 10 years mm -hmm. uh, on and off because in the middle he did animation and was directing stuff. But um, so the, the, the prototype he showed at the Brooklyn Comics Fest, and I think it was on a panel with Charles Burns and Chris Ware and uh, Bill was moderating them and, and Art Spiegelman probably. And they were all talking about just the medium and, and he was showing he was showing it on, um, he had watercolor, he had stuff from his sketchbook, he based it on family photos. He mm -hmm. was researching all this vernacular stuff. He had spent a residency at the New York Public Library, which I recommend to all cartoonists to apply to at the Coleman, the Coleman Fellowship. Oh. Um, and and it's it's meant for um, for people writing books that I think you should maybe too because I, I bet there's so much stuff on Mormons mm. um, in the archives yeah. are, because they have amazing archives and and all you have to do I mean you need recommendations and stuff but you have to prove that you need their archive for your book okay. so he was doing a lot of research and and there was a mashup of styles and at first he was um thinking about redoing everything or or how how will the, the the big riddle of the book was how will everything work together um stylistically um and and it ended up leaving those things in leaving a lot of the original things and i think it's um even you can see in the book here the cat the black cat walking across appears in the original strip in yeah. in the raw magazine and I think it's that magical moment of um, contextualizing it. And, and it, it kind of reminds me of David Boring, uh, Dan Klaus's David Boring, where um, the panels of the life of David kind of merge with the panels that he's drawing. So there's kind of the book that enters the book and becomes, it shows the power of the medium that the storytelling is more substantial than any any separation between things. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times um, when I hear podcasts about comics, there's that dilemma of if you have a character that changes through the book, do you go back and change it? Or the coherency or, or having a book that looks like it was planned through. Um, and, and, and that the book here, because of its uh, windows into the past was also win windows into the own artist's past. Like it made it even more personal than the fact that it was located in his house or mm -hmm. had his family or had him inside. I think that cat was the most personal thing or leaving the schedule. Anyway, yeah. the, I'm diverging, but what I was going to say is that um, he had, so the, all, but all the new drawings, he needed someone to help because the deadline was short, it was there was a year, and um, it was blue pencil. And he had an exhibition at the Morgan Library where he showed all of the sketches, and uh, we were laughing because it was like that he was drawing all the originals with non photo, -photo blue. <laughs> oh, just the thing. <laughs> but it kind of uh, so I knew really nothing. So I I, I asked my friend Mael to join to join because Mael knows. She's like a jack of all trade, and she made everything uh, kind of work and click together. And then, so we we met with him um, um, at the beginning more intensely. We worked in the same space, and then once a week. Uh, but we also went on these research trips, which I think he did more for us. You, in this field, it's so crucial that someone takes you under their wing. I think yeah. even he was so. And, and that is why I, I also want to teach and why I appreciate CCS so much and, and the teachers there, because they all have their careers and they have their deadlines, but they know that it's impossible, completely impossible to achieve anything without someone helping you or, or opening your eyes to things that with our limited time, because we're in the studio all day, we will never get to see. And he took time to take us to museums and to shows and to even concert wow. um, be because they all and show and then showed us how they inspired the book or directly wow. like it's crazy that's um, cool i'm jealous 
But yeah, and we laugh because there was another person on that team of assistants called Min, and we never saw him, ever, mm -hmm. and never talked to him. And he was there on Fridays, and and then one day we were in the studio and we looked up, and on the door was like a post-it that said "Back in five min," like mm -hmm. a short minutes. And then we thought, oh, so Richard was talking to us on the phone, and then he looked up and needed a name real quick, so we just took that and made up an assistant. Oh, really? <laughs> one day we came to the studio and he said. I convinced Min to 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 cameo and pose for me as one of the characters. He's in the book now. You shall see. He was real along, and he's the one character that in the book is carrying stuff that completely hides his face. <laughs> <laughs> I live in the Middle East, and there's comics happening in Lebanon and Egypt, and amazing stuff that I I get to see through. Um, we had uh, someone in Beirut at CCS, Hashem, and and um, he showed me these comics that are incredible, and I'll, and they live so close, and we miss it because of the political infrastructure. Um, Josh O'Neill, who owns Behead Books, uh, went there as a guest uh, last year, and he posted uh, on Facebook. He posted a bunch of. Um, cartoonists and books and oh my gosh it's amazing yeah, um, I'm so jealous <laughs> jealous and also complete infuriated that that it, there's such a kind of um, um, I mean uh, I of course am not allowed to go to Lebanon and even um, we had a couch surfer um, who researches uh, comics Dean Simons um, he's English and um, he was in Israel to um, to interview Palestinian artists. I asked him if he can bring some books back with him, or or show me, or if, or if he could ask them if they would be willing to be interviewed. Or um, and a lot of and and the answer is usually twofold. A is they're not allowed because it's it's a real danger to collaborate with Israelis, and wow. B they don't want. The whitewashing aspect of it, because it wow. kind of, you know, it, it's you have to be really careful about this stuff. Because for me, it's like a benign curiosity, but then I don't realize that I'm speaking in in a position where I I kind of always want to to emphasize that through art everything can be fine <laughs> just just out of the naiveness of my thinking but then um but then sometimes you th there's actually an importance to preserving these boundaries because the preservation of the boundaries um highlights or shows that things are not normal and until we can we don't get to see it because it, it's kind of yeah, I mean, I can think of no better term. It probably is a better term, but whitewashing, because if you show that there, there can be peaceful collaborations and, and enriching collaborations through art, then you neglect the problem or, or there's no urgency on the problem. Um, but I I don't know. I, I'm i not speaking out of any particular knowledge, Just just things that I'm kind of thinking between myself and I. What? Are there Israeli editions of your books out? No. <laughs> I think the only reason I'm able to get published in uh, in the States to begin with is the personal knowledge because people know me as a person. Mm -hmm. um, I think my stuff, and that's what I, I, I mean, I've gotten really bad emails like, this is the most boring book I've ever read, or I don't understand anything of this uh, about my work. <laughs> no, I mean, you're right. It's very, it's very uncommunicative. But I think, um, um, and I mean, I take it, I take it like with a tongue in cheek, uh -huh. not, not someone being aggressive, but just yeah. saying, you know, in a French, like being honest, but, yeah. but not cruel. And, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think, I do think that, um, and, came to be published in the first place is, is that I was lucky enough to live in the States and to go to festivals so people can get to know me. And I think until people knew who I was in person, they didn't 
my work meant nothing because I, I mean I was, I was I'm doing something that's completely me it's like a mix of dance and and the poetry that I like and just weird things and references that are very idiosyncratic mm-hmm. um and then but they represent how I talk very well um and and also I was kind of on the advice of my teachers showing that and I think it, it's important it's an important piece of advice is showing that do the work of for it or coming to festivals and and uh, making it alive like I made the academic hour a stop motion animation or just infusing it and but I think that um until I became friends with people and the comics that I self-publish or, or that are published now by Secret Acres, I'm demonstrating what I learned by being in this community of artists. And, and like each comic that I make um, has in it things that you can trace where they came, my peer, my group of peers or what inspired it. And it's like my, my it's a very direct conversation that I'm taking part. And it doesn't stand, I don't see it as standing alone. What I like, for instance, about the now anthologies is that it kind of is a conversation about the things that comics can do. Yeah. Um, and the the sum is 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 um, well, some parts are pure genius and they do stand by their own, but also the, the it, it shows you like an index of of the potential of a medium, which which I feel very comfortable trying stuff in. Mm. Um, but but I think it's due to luck. I think there there are a lot of um, I think it, even in 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 Israel, my stuff wouldn't maybe now because I'm 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 more active in the scene or I'm taking on more like um, curation cura, curational roles or starting to curate sure. them. Yeah, <laughs> or as a pu- publisher, then then there is a context for it. But I think. Um, I think no one, there's no audience for my stuff. If if no one knows me personally as a friend, I don't know. Um, you, think, you don't think people are like when they see your books out in the world that they just pick it up and go, "This is interesting," and they want to own it. You think uh, that that happens, you know? I I do get emails sometimes, but but a very I I don't think um, I'm not putting myself. Well, I guess I am putting myself down, but <laughs> the comics that I'm drawn to read are are ones where um, either someone has instilled their voice by telling me why they like it, and then I read it and I enjoy it, and the, and and the stories, or I meet someone at a festival and I want a, a memento of them and I want their voice in my head, and I also want to kind of I'm curious about the link between how they are as a person and um, what they make in their hand. Mm-hmm. And and I, I also really enjoy collecting stuff over, over the years to see that. Um, so I think in the States, I've had the opportunity to do that because over the years, I've put out maybe 50 self-published zines and, and there's like a, a progression of it. And I think uh, I really miss Tom Spurgeon because he was, um, like I miss him with tears because he's the kind of he's exactly that kind of reader that um, you I, I see you you show him books because he's a he's um, a, a reporter or re- reviewer at first like by instinct but he's like not even looking he looks you in the eye and he's like hey how are you enjoying the show tell me a good story and he wants your friendship first that kind of thing is what I am probably trying to describe. Yeah, he was um, interested in in cartoonists, like in the person, like. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I think about him all the time. I love that guy. He was great. Do you yeah, um, do you read reviews of your work? I do. Yes. What's that experience like? Are they good? <laughs> but I think I think we're in very different places. I've I've heard you talk about that with. Um, yeah. Summer Peter. I, I think I think I think the only I think you're. I think the more your stuff, it, it's it's again going to sound like I'm I'm dissing myself. I'm not because it's a very conscious choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I everything I do is autobiographical, but it's very very hidden under heavy surreal um, weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think the more 
your characters are relatable, the more your story is exposed, like with your books, then you're going to get the, the wide um, yeah. range readership. Of, yeah. Opinions, range of, of emotions, and also just, just a really wide audience. And my stuff is very, very, very... Um, I think I owe a lot to Secret Acres for knowing where I want to go and mm. leading me leading me there and and really taking time to parse it and yeah. I think and I I only get like maybe four or five reviews per book mm. um by very very cartoonist centric by people who are like um Rob Clow and the comics journal and um a, a recent one by Ryan Curry and and they all blow me away by because it takes they really I can see and it moves me to tears that they really want to see me there like yeah. see where, where where I am and, and to understand it and they take a lot of time but this mm. is not reviews that are um but yeah those four so I read them because it's 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 the it's the only chance I can get to um see see what other what my stuff looks like in other people's eyes and and that and I cherish that because I want I want to learn what I really want to do is learn how to um create the kind of books that I want to re I read like story driven books so I'm taking a class a graphic novel class with Paul Karasik this summer oh great uh, that's great I wish I should do that too actually that would be I really respect him I'd like to to yeah. take the class with him too. All right, yeah. Karen, I, I want to. We're gonna end the uh, interview here, but I wanted to thank you for doing this, taking taking your time out and talking to me. Yeah. Um. Thank you. So.